In the first segment of this series of videos, we invited people to momentarily put aside our accepted notions and dogmas about how the cosmos works and, for just a while, consider various evidence within the context of different explanatory frameworks. So, in essence, we asked people to allow themselves to ask some big what-if questions. Indeed, some of these what-if questions can be quite dangerous and elicit very negative emotional responses from those working within the accepted ideology. This is what makes these questions dangerous. But what is so dangerous about a simple inquisitive what-if question? Why should it be so difficult for those working within an ideology to pose these questions, especially when there is evidence causing them to ask them in the first place? Well, the answer to that, as with most things involving the very human endeavor of science, is not straightforward and always involves the personalities of the key players, the social context of the time, and fundamentally, a very normal human fear. There's fear on the side of those working within the established ideology that their work will be undermined, but also fear from those asking the what-if questions. Fear of ridicule, scorn, or other negative feedback from their peers. Maybe not downright persecution, but it is usually a very uncomfortable experience. Rowingen, when discovering x-rays, was widely ridiculed, and Lord Kelvin, a fairly important personality at the time, speculated that the findings were probably a hoax. Lynn Margulis, who proposed endosymbiotic organelles, was denied funding and basically told never to apply again. Watson and Crick, uh, working on the structure of DNA, of course, had to do that work on the side due to a lack of support for their ideas. Barbara McClintock suffered decades of ridicule while proposing the idea of transposition in genomes, the idea of transposons, little genetic fragments that jump about the genome, and encountered open hostility in some cases. Halton Arp, of course, in providing evidence that indicated redshift is not related to distance, a finding which would basically falsify the Big Bang dogma, without a doubt, put his career in harm's way by pursuing that line of inquiry. He was denied telescope time, his papers were rejected. It would be disingenuous to deny Arp's rather rough treatment at the hands of his peers and the establishment at the time. So all this to say, these what-if questions, even when proposed by established scientists with supporting evidence, will more often than not trigger very negative reaction from their community of peers. But in all these cases, the people involved followed the evidence. Within the Electric Universe framework, there are many lines of evidence cited that prompt some uncomfortable what-if questions. For example, there are numerous observations of our own sun inconsistent with it being a thermonuclear campfire in space, There's lack of a sufficient convection zone. The corona is orders of magnitude hotter than the photosphere. There is an accelerating solar wind, etc. So the what-if question here is, what if the sun is not fundamentally fusion-powered, but electrically driven? Fusion, no doubt, is present, but maybe a secondary phenomenon. Features on Mars are clearly inconsistent with fluid flow or impact models, and instead actually seem consistent with electrical scarring. Well, what if the surface of Mars was shaped by massive electrical discharges? Where does that lead us? On Comet 67P, the lack of water ice, the surface features like dunes and stratification are inconsistent with the notion of a dirty snowball theory. So what if comets really are rocky bodies moving through an electrical gradient in their surrounding plasma? Multiple lines of evidence taken at face value should trigger some fascinating what if questions. We owe it to ourselves to ask regardless of the potential negative emotional response of those in the established ideology. Discovery comes from asking these dangerous what-if questions and following the evidence where it leads.